we're all here. Um, and I want to thank you everyone for logging in and joining our session today. Um, the session is entitled The World is Burning, and we'll be hearing from our panelists on innovative private capital solutions to reducing the risk of wildfire. My name is Siobhan King, and I lead product management for Impact Assets, and I'm going to be the moderator of this panel today. And I'm joined by a set of stakeholders who are working on understanding and creating new solutions to our megafire problem. Uh, and that includes Willie Willessi from the, the general manager of Uber Water Agency, Dr. Paul Hesberg, a research landscape ecologist with the Pacific Northwest Research Station of the US Forest Service, uh, Adam Conacher, a principal with the Rockefeller Foundation, and Zach Knight, CEO and co-founder of Blue Forest Conservation. And for this first few minutes of the session, we'll use a few slides. And so as audience members, you can double click on the PowerPoint slides to make them bigger. I can't do that for you. So if you want to enlarge them, go ahead and do that yourself. Um, and type any questions you have in the chat window. I'll keep an eye on those and bring them to the group as um, when we get to the panel discussion. And so if we were all in a room together, I would love to ask everyone by show of hands, how many of you have been impacted by this year's wildfires? And I think a lot of hands would go up. My hand would go up. Um, this, Zach's hand is up. I'm sure this whole group's hand is up. Um, this picture is taken near my home, near San Francisco, at 10 o'clock in the morning a few weeks ago, looking straight into the sun. The sun's right there in front of you, but you can't see it because this was one of the days where the fires in the West turned San Francisco into this apocalyptic orange sky. And it was just unreal. And in the, the weeks before and after that, um, we've had ash raining down and wildfires have really smothered residents across the Western United States and some of the worst air quality in the world with the haze reaching all the way to the East Coast. Uh, once a rare occurrence, these mega fires, which are you know fires that are larger than 100,000 acres, have become more common. This year, we've had more than 6 million acres in the United States burned, which is the equivalent to the size of the state of New Hampshire. And tragically, we've lost 37 lives this year because of the wildfires. But there's good news, and we're here to talk about the good news, which is that the science and historical land management practices behind these wildfires is well understood and the challenges in scaling some of those solution sets that we have and funding those solutions. And so because understanding megafires is the first step into understanding how to address them, I've asked Dr. Hesberg to give us a talk and make us all experts on the context of these recent wildfires. Thank you, Siobhan. Yeah. All right, so we notice that uh, wildfires are changing the Western US. In fact, they're changing Western North America. And uh, this slide basically shows a transition of a forest landscape from the early 20th century to the early 21st century. Next slide. Next slide, thank you. Um, this is a look at uh, a forest landscape from the interior of Washington state. And on the top in 1930, you can see a landscape that was basically covered mostly by grasses with uh, pine forest growing on the north slopes down in the valley bottoms. You can see early in the 21st century how a grass dominated landscape, even in the driest conditions has become dominated by trees. Next slide, please. This is another landscape where we're a little bit higher in elevation and you can see how the driest aspects, which you can see are sparsely treed in the top photo, have filled in with trees. And so there's an awful lot more forested area and the forested area is now denser. Next slide. And these are further up in elevation. That's Mount Rainier in the background. And you can see how a once varied patchwork of forest age and size and density and non-forest area has filled in with 
homogeneous forest. So up and down the environmental gradient, forests have accrued and they've gotten denser. Next slide, please. What caused this? Timber harvesting, clear-cut logging, and selection cutting. Selection cutting is cutting the biggest and the best trees. Fire exclusion by livestock grazing, developing the built environment and fire suppression, and climate change. The climate since the middle 80s is warmer, it's drier, and it's now often windier. Next slide, please. What did that do to the landscape? It did a couple of important things that you need to know about. In the first case, seasonally dry forests between June and late September, they historically had a lot of fires and these fires were continually thinning out trees, reducing dead wood on the ground, reducing tree density, especially in the smaller sizes. And so medium and large sized trees tended to survive over time. And across big landscape areas, what we saw is that patchwork that I showed you some examples of, that patchwork got homogenized with forest. Forest increased, they colonized grass and shrublands, and then the variety of ages of forest became homogeneous with an awful lot of it middle to later aged. And that explains significant changes in fire severity. So the patchwork itself regulated future fire severity and future fire size. It stopped the flow of fire. Next slide, please. So what you get when you keep fire out of the woods is a lot of regeneration and release of trees. And this is the condition that speaks to the kind of fire severity we're seeing today. Next slide, please. Let's look at a cartoon of that fire severity. I really want you to only see a couple of things. Conditions in the top row are historical, 1800. Conditions in the bottom row are 21st century. Hot colors, severe conditions, cool colors, less severe. What I'm trying to show you is how the structure of the forest on the left, while varied historically, became more homogenized. And that accounted for changes in deadwood on the ground, fuel loading, Crown fire potential, which is the likelihood that fire from the forest floor will get up into the tree crowns and run, and flame length, short versus long flame lengths. And that's important because fire suppression happens when flame lengths are short, four feet or less. Next slide, please. Is there a path forward? There certainly is where we have the goal to reliably maintain forests, protect watersheds, water quality, water quantity, habitats for fish, wildlife, and humans, a lot of forests need a hand down. They're maladapted to the current climate and the climate is getting moodier. Wildfire severity is unprecedented. It doesn't look anything like it did in 17, 18, or 1900. And modern wildfires are a blunt management tool. They're not working well enough to meet management objectives. There are better tools available. We can use managed wildfires burning in the right conditions and time of year. We can do prescribed burning in the backcountry. So those are wilderness areas, national parks and the like. Or we can do thinning and prescribed burning where the fuels are too great to use fire alone tools. And this actually is a very large area. And ongoing maintenance is essential. There's no one and done with uh, making Western landscapes in better shape. There are two key, key impediments are large scale funding and limited personnel for doing the, this proactive work. I think that's the last of my slides, Siobhan. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Paul. And I wanted to hear also. Well, so first, I think it's it's surprising to people sometimes to hear that in order that it can be healthy for forests to thin them and remove and burn them. Um, and that's part of the solution set. And Willie, I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you could unmute yourself and you can tell us um, as a water agency manager, how, you, you know, what is your interest and involvement in the wildfire discussion? How do these fires impact our water systems? And why would your agency be interested in solving 
the problem at scale? Yeah, so that's a that's an excellent question. Um, you know, the source of our water is about 300,000 acres of the North Yuba watershed primarily in Northern California. And it's, I don't know, 80 to 90% forested with mixed conifer forest. And um, the, the watershed to the north of us, the Feather River watershed, literally just a month ago, and maybe is still burning today, um, experienced a 300,000 acre wildfire. That, it started as the Bear Fire, and now it's one of the complex fires. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we had the campfire. It, it's in the Feather River watershed as well. Um, in 2014, the American River watershed south of us burned about half of that watershed burned up in 150,000 acre fire. And um, we have a, um, a sister agency, Placer County Water Agency, that experienced major um, mitigation costs for the removal of sediment and debris from their reservoir. And so we're just really in a race against time to treat our watershed to make it resilient to the, these threats from catastrophic wildfire. And um, we want to prevent, you know, this destructive fire. We want to prevent the cost that we'll incur in cleaning up our reservoir, um, both the surface of the reservoir and sediment inputs. And we really want a healthy, resilient forest that provides uh, the quality and quantity of water that are naturally provided in our watershed. Our watershed is it's overstocked because of fire exclusion, and um, we want to get it back to a more resilient, natural state. Um, yeah, that's really the primary reason why we're involved and we've been involved in the past few years. Great, thank you. And Zach, um, can you tell us a little bit about your your work at Blue Forest? And um, I think you've shared with me that this is a $58 billion problem and public funding alone won't get us there. And so tell us about how we can bring private capital to the conversation and to the solution. Yeah, absolutely, Siobhan. I think it's worth building on a little bit of what Dr. Hesburgh said. When you look through the Forest Service budget, um, annually they get about five, five and a half billion dollars and about half a billion dollars we can use uh, towards proactive restoration. Um, but importantly, over the last 20 years, more and more of that budget has been siphoned off for fire suppression. Going back to 1995, that was probably 15% of the budget. In 2017, it was 56% of the budget for the Forest Service or $2.7 billion. And what that does is it creates this vicious cycle where we're spending more and more money suppressing fires and we're pulling that money away from the work that could actually prevent these fires in the first place. Um, and again, to build off Dr. Hesburgh's point, we understand what needs to happen on this landscape from a scientific standpoint. And in fact, I'd, I'd argue the Forest Service has been involved in some form of landscape uh, restoration for at least the last 50 years. So it's a known, it's a tried and true um, practice. We know that it works. And what we really have here is not a science problem, but a finance problem. Uh, that's how we look at it at Blue Forest. And that sort of helped push us together along with our partners at the Forest Service and the World Resources Institute to create the Forest Resilience Bond. And at a high level, this is a public-private partnership that allows private capital um, from groups like foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation, but also market rate impact investors like Calvert Impact Capital or insurance companies to cover the massive upfront costs associated with doing these restoration projects that again are designed to reduce fire risk, but as Willie said, confer a number of benefits to other groups like water and electric utilities, flood control districts, state agencies. So we allow all of the beneficiaries um, to repay based on the benefits that they receive over a time period that makes sense for them. And in our first project, it really was a truly public-private partnership, including government at the federal, state, and local level. Um, and I, something you said in there about, uh, that I sort of put out, forth, put out at the beginning too, but that we don't have a science problem, we have a funding problem. Um, and I, I think that's based on the understanding, right, that we, know a lot about the solution set and forest thinning and prescribed burns and land management. Um, but Paul, can you share some insights with us on how well do we understand these methods and, and sort of what are the limiting factors to going to scale? We've mentioned the funding, but are there others and, and how do they, um, what does that look like? Zach really encapsulated it. Uh, 25 years ago, I think 15 to 17% of the entire budget went to suppression. And as he mentioned, it's 55 to 
of the entire budget goes to fire suppression. And what that's done is extracted resources, disciplines that can do the proactive work. But as he also suggested, the proactive work's been going on for a long time. The Forest Service uh, is down 12, 13,000 boots on the ground employees. These were people who did the proactive work and those resources have been shunted into the fire suppression, the fire preparedness workforce right now. And so an awful lot of it is taking very well tested methods and apply them as is appropriate to the right places on the landscape to get the intended effects. And we understand how fire behavior uh, is driven. So we literally are manipulating the levers that control fire behavior. Manipulating those levers in the um in the, the in the methods on the ground, yeah. You reduce dead wood on the ground, there's less energy to ignite the canopies. You raise the crown bases of the canopies, the flames can't get there. And so the forest that you want for water or habitat or for for future uh wood products, they're there because you manipulated what drives fire behavior with the right tools. Right. Yeah, and I think some people in the audience might not um know that we keep talking about the crown fire versus keeping and keeping the fire low on the in the forest floor and that really relates to the speed at which it can spread and the scale at which it can reach and so that's really um important um and in talking about these solutions adam i i know that the rockefeller foundation is really um charged with scaling in taking solutions to scale and solving big problems and so can you tell us about you know, your interest and involvement in the Forest Resilience Fund and, and what about this solution um, makes it well poised to, to reach that scale? Yeah, absolutely, Siobhan. I, I mean, I think- Oh, and you're on mute. Oh, oh you guys still on mute? Is it working? No, you're good, go ahead. Okay, thanks. No, listen, I, I think this is one of those issues and, and Zach and, and, and the others have, have really highlighted as well, which is where, you know, our team has looked to support innovative financial structures where we think that the solution is very clear, where the need is very clear, um, and, and where we can build towards the deployment and, and the sort of execution in time. Um, but where the financing challenge is also very clear, right? And in this case, you've got a situation where you've got a number of beneficiaries um, who really do rely on the health and well-being of those forests um, and are willing to put up dollars. And Willie told you about that and why. Um, and you've got forests that dramatically need this. So for us, we looked at this and sort of said, all right, you know, are the dynamics here to really create a robust, robust market or not? And, and, and they are for us. And it's not a complicated equation, right? It's you know, what would attract an investor in the long run? And that depends, of course, on who the investor is. But if we assume it's a, you know, a larger sort of, um, you know, more institutional grade investor, it's going to be the size of the market, the ability to see and understand that market um, and, and produce consistent returns, right, over time. And, and for us, you know, this is a tens of financing challenge that we don't see going away in the next five years, right? So this is one where we see an enormous market where investors could get, you know, really involved. Um, we also look at it from the perspective of, You've got investors who <clears throat> are trying to build out their ESG or sustainable or impact portfolios or the lens with which they look at their entire portfolio in that way. Um, and, and this is quite frankly a unique offering, right? This is offerings from um, players they don't traditionally get to, to backstop, right? The US Forest Service, uh, water agencies and utilities, groups like that that are coming to them with an impact product. Um, that fits on the fixed income side um, and has some scale to it. So, you know, we really looked at this and said, yes, you've got sort of an investable opportunity that makes a ton of sense. Now, where I think the challenge lies, and, and the others can talk to this far greater than I can, but, you know, the next step is, can we really execute on it over time? And, and, and Zach's been working on this for a very long time on the first step of that, which is just, how do we get these projects in a position where we're ready to go, right? How do we actually move them to the starting line, um, which takes grant capital like our own? And, and you know, we've obviously funded um, Zach and the team to do exactly that, right? Work with the Forest Service, work with the water utilities, work on the permitting, work on the science, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the next question is, even if you had the money, you know, do you have enough people to go and deploy it at scale? And, and I think the others will tell you that, that you don't yet. Um, and that's a huge challenge as well. But again, I view those as things we can tackle. We can overcome that kind of an issue when you have the market dynamics that we've got that are, you know, this big, robust um, and, and returns producing market, then I tend to think you've got something that makes sense. And so, you know, for our own uh, our own team, it really came down to that was enough to, to sort of bet on this solution. And, and we're super excited that we got, you know, the first pilot up and running. And, and quite frankly, for us, it's about, you know, how do we get 
two or five or 10 more of those pilots up and running in the next two years, because this idea does make sense. Um, and, and, and we're excited to see it scale. And when you, so Adam, I'm curious for both you and Zach maybe you could, um, could respond on, you know, you talked about for a certain set of investors, the mar the compelling market size is, is, um, is what they're looking for. But for most investors, they want things that look familiar and that's kind of, and something where they understand the risks and this is a new structure, a new product. So um, I'm curious what the lessons learned have been in the fundraising process through your first bond and, and going into this, to your upcoming bonds next year. Um, and what's sort of the most effective way to, to pitch someone on this product, given that it's not something they've seen before? Zach, if it's okay, I'll, I'll take the first 10 seconds and then I can let you, because I think you've got a far better story to tell here. But I think maybe building on my previous comments right around, this is a robust market. We think this market has new players, you know, that are attractive from an investor perspective as the counterparty on the deal. Um, but I think also, you know, th there's no, no getting around sort of the risk return profile. And we think this is another case where it makes a lot of sense. And, and if you looked at where we started with this project, you know, Zach and I, when we started working on this years ago, um, it was a far more complicated product where we were trying to hinge the returns on a lot more things than we are today. Um, and, and really understanding that the investors don't want to see that level of, uh, I'll call it what was innovation, but, but quite frankly, isn't innovation, it's complexity, right? And I think, you know, we've learned a lot in that process. But Zach, I, I'd love for you to sort of talk through, because I think you probably can tell this story far better than I can. Yeah, I will be quick about it. I mean, I think the, the most important thing here is when you structure these investments, you need to do two things. You need to make it look and feel like something that's already in the portfolio of these institutional investors. And what we really strive for here is something that looks and feels like infrastructure project finance. Um, in the United States alone, there's trillions of dollars invested in public-private partnerships, private infrastructure, uh, and the like. And the more that this looks like that, we can take a new and innovative concept like the Forest Resilience Bond, and we can start to make it boring. And, and that's actually the goal with all of this. I think the other challenge here is the size. We picked a project that was pretty good sized by Forest Service standards. It protects 15,000 acres with about 7,000 acres of treatment within that larger 15,000 acre project area. You know, we only needed to raise about $4 million for that project. So for anybody that's watching this panel that's gone out and raised money before, uh, it's actually a lot harder to raise just $4 million than it is to raise 40 or 400. And that really, you know, my background's on Wall Street, so I was aware of that. People in the Forest Service think I'm crazy when I say something like that. But we did work with an insurance company that managed, they're small, but they manage about $9 billion. And what I heard from that portfolio manager was like, are you sure we can't do 10 million? It has to be just a single million? Because from an investor perspective, it's the exact same amount of due diligence, whether they're making a million dollar loan or a $10 million loan. So I think the biggest challenge from the Blue Forest perspective is, how do we work with the Forest Service, the World Resources Institute, and our other partners to increase the size of what we can actually offer to investors? Um, and we're actually seeing that happen. Our next project that will involve Willie and the Yuba Water Agency will hopefully be between maybe 12 and $16 million. So again, not enormous from the standpoint uh, as you compare to other investment opportunities and quite small uh, when you look at it against the, the general world of fixed income. Um, but to be able to take something up size-wise that big, that quickly, this will only be about two years or so after we close the first project, that's really meaningful. And we need to sort of hit that slope and keep going here. Yeah, great. Um, uh, I have one more question before I think we have to go to our closing soon because this isn't a particularly long uh -huh. session at just 45 minutes. So time flies. Um, but I wanted to take it a little bit from the forests and... Um, more sort of implied wilderness that we've been talking about and the the connection to communities. And, you know, Willie, maybe this comes through in our water systems. Um, and I'm curious what, you know, this is an open question for everyone, but um, how, you know, how does this, the Forest Resilience Fund or these practices connect with community resilience to wildfires? And is it just for people kind of living in that urban wildland interface or um, or just how do you, how does that fit for you all? I'll, I'll go ahead and, and go first here. Um, you know, the Forest Resilience Bond and the project that I work with Zach on, um, 
know, that was really what we were hoping to be like a catalyst to future collaboration and, and future partnerships. That's in the upper reaches of our watershed. And there's definitely, um, there's, there's like summer homes in the area and in cabins and things, but it's not near like a, a community per se, or a year round community. It's way up, you know, in the high elevation. But what we were hoping to do is to show that, you know, there can be collaboration between, you know, water agencies and the forest service and, and groups like um, the Blue Forest Conservation Group. And then there can be this funding mechanism that can work as well. And we really just wanted to show that all that works in an effort to have it be expanded, you know, throughout our watershed, like Zach just mentioned, and also throughout the Sierra Nevada or anywhere in, you know, Western United States, as far as I can tell. Um, but, but that was really it. And I think that the next phase that Zach and I and others are working on is, is a larger project that are around these communities, these small communities of a few thousand people each in our foothills and our, our mid elevation um, areas in our, in our watershed. So that's really what we were hoping is they would expand and that's happening. Siobhan, I'd jump in with just one other thing. So in addition to reducing the risk of catastrophic wildfire in and around communities, I think a big aspect of community resilience is actually jobs, right? Um, we're working in Sierra County, which I believe is one of the poorest, if not the poorest counties in California. Um, and prior to COVID, when we were, you know, 2.7, 2.8% statewide uninsured, uh, unemployment, uh, Sierra County was at 15.5% unemployment, right? So we don't only lack the people to do this work and the infrastructure with which to do it, but there are also unemployed people in these areas that could do this. And when you look at the work on the ground, it's a wide variety of skill. There's chainsaw work, which you can get certified in a day or a weekend, heavy machinery equipment that pays well, that requires apprenticeship, all the way to the burn bosses, which by the way is the coolest job title out there, that manage the prescribed fire on the landscape. And you might need to train three to five years, if not more, Position. So it doesn't matter if you don't have a high school degree or what level of college or graduate school you have, there are jobs in the forest for everyone. If we make the investments now to start to do this work, reduce the risk, these are the other co-benefits we talk about. It's not just protecting air quality and source water, but it's creating jobs and really defining the restoration economy that, that folks probably are hearing quite a bit about at SOCAP this year. Maybe, Siobhan, if I could add one more thing on this, since we all seem to love this question, but um, you know, as part of our diligence for the grants and the investment, we went out and actually visited the forest, right? Because living in New York at the Rockefeller Foundation, we don't actually see any of these forests that burn. We only see it if it gets really bad and the air quality tends to get affected over here as well. Um, but, but so we went out and we visited at the time what was the, it, well, is the rim fire burn, um, which I think at the time was still the largest in California, which has been blown out of the water now um, with the new burns that have come through. Uh, this year and in the previous years. But one of the things that struck me on that visit was just the length of time of recovery, right? So it's not just the immediacy, um, which is enormous. And I think, you know, I, I'm just looking at the chat and most comment about the idea of, you know, air quality and friends and family living there, like the stresses on our communities are very real right now, but the long-term stresses are real as well, right? These are not exactly communities that have infinite options, right? They're not connected to urban centers in the same way. They tend to be more remote. And when we looked at the Rim Fire, um, you know, some of the science community that was with us on the visit basically made the point. They said, well, you know, this was a full devastating burn. It was a, a big, intense burn. It lasted for a long time. And, and therefore, all, you know, all the sort of tree cover was removed um, and, and the animals are gone. But he said, you know, you're 100 to 150 years uh, before this will realistically support wildlife again. Um, and you're more like a thousand years before you'll have a diverse ecosystem that looked anything like, you know, what it, we wanted it to look like uh, going into this thing, right? Where it actually has lots of different species and and, uh, and whatnot represented. And so if you think about sort of what's lost in that many years, right, this isn't a 10, 20 year recovery. We're talking about a hundred plus years to get back to any usable forest in a way that it can support those communities, whether we're using it for recreation, whether we're using it for the jobs, that Zach is describing, whether we're using it for the water that Willie's describing. I mean, all of this is tied to a healthy system and you can't get it back quickly. So when you say resilience, I really think about like, we got to avoid not just the plume of, you know, CO2 and, and, you know, devastation that happens in the immediate fire, but we got to avoid the 150 year recovery window or thousand year recovery window that we're looking at on some of these giant fires as well. <clears throat> yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we are, we just have about 12 minutes left. So I'm gonna do sort of one closing question and give you each a, a quick 30 seconds to a minute to tell me what um, the silver linings are from these unprecedented fires and what you're most excited about going forward. You know, this has been a tough year for everyone and those in the West are facing this extra weight of 
poor air quality and protecting our homes and loved ones. But it also feels different in terms of the awareness um, and the activation around the problem. So I'd love to go around and hear what each of you are, are looking forward to or hope we can take out of this experience. And you can feel free to dive in or I'll call on someone first. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the cultural shift is probably the biggest thing that I've learned and the silver lining here. I've, I went to forestry school in the mid 1990s and, um, you know, cutting down a tree or removing a tree from the forest was, you know, it wasn't culturally accepted, right, or socially accepted. And now, at least in California with these, you know, catastrophic wildfires, we're seeing a need to manage our forest. And so, unfortunately, it has taken these catastrophic, you know, multiple hundred thousand acre wildfires to, to educate us that something needs to be done. But I think we're past that. I think we're at the point where we realize we need to do something. And now, like, like you guys are, are telling us, um, Zach and Adam, it's not a science problem. We're past that. Now we just need to get the money and get to work and train the people. And so there's going to be opportunities with jobs. And I think that we're in the right, we're going the right direction. I know that's more than 30 seconds, but thanks. Okay. Siobhan, I'll jump in quickly and say that I think we communicate really, really well with the two to 3% of the world that's in this space and understands this. I think what this year is bringing out is how do we talk to the other 97 or 98 percent of folks that don't understand that, hey, cutting down a tree is actually a good thing. And this in starting fires on the ground, prescribed fire, broadcast burning, it's actually a really healthy way to reinvigorate the natural fire cycle. From our perspective at Blue Forest, our model relies on people taking collective action. We help and sort of nudge that along um, as it takes place. But we always thought fire was enough to cause collective action, and it hasn't been yet. But I think this year it really is the turning point, whether you're at the federal, state, or local level. This is all everybody's talking about. Um, and it's something I'm hearing a lot about in Sacramento, too, from the legislature. Mm. Great. Thanks. We'll tag on. Oh, go ahead, Adam. <laughs> Sorry, I think we both thought, saw the same window. Um, no, listen, I, I think uh, for me, it echoes a little bit of Willie's comment that I think this is an expansion of the stakeholders. And, and I really appreciate that we're getting more people connected in. I, I didn't see Robert Fishkin, you made the, the comment about stakeholders connecting. And I think that's exactly the point we're trying to get to right here is that this touches so many more lives um, and people are really engaging. And I think what's cool about what Blue Forest did, but, but it's not the only example. There's actually more and more of these examples of thinking about ecosystems as they interconnect into our resilience, as they interconnect into our lives, into our jobs, as opposed to just things that we extract from or visit, you know, when we go on a hike, that kind of thing. So I, I think we're getting a much better understanding. And, and in doing so, you know, people are getting creative about how they get involved. This is one example of that creativity, but I, I think there's tons of this stuff emerging. And I don't think that it relies so much. I mean, um, th this topic tends not to be so partisan, but but it doesn't rely on, on on so much federal support anyway, right? We're moving towards a direction where the communities can take more ownership because you know, we've got groups like Yuba County Water Agency that are involved and are getting really engaged directly. And so I tend to see, you know, where the future is bright is this sort of increasing awareness that we can invest into our ecosystems, right? We can work with our ecosystems. We can use those ecosystems in a way that benefits us, um, but, but without destroying them, right? Without, without taking an exploitive nature. So, um, you know, that's the silver lining for me. Unfortunately, I think it's taken a long time for us to, to get there, but, but listen, we're here now and, and we can hopefully move at some scale. Yeah, thank you, Adam. All right, Dr. Hesberg, you get the last word. And then for everyone in the audience, go ahead and type some questions into the chat window. We've got a few minutes that we can um, put those up to the panelists. I'd like to underscore something that Zach said that's really critically important. If you think about the, the fire that burned down Paradise, the flaming front was five miles away and it was embers coming from five miles away that ignited the town of Paradise. So that 97% that, that are operating outside this space is our target. We really need to have people understand how that affect us throughout the West come from some distance away. It's not just the municipal watershed or the built environment. The risks come from outside those domains as well. And so we need to be thinking about big landscapes and we think need to be thinking about big pace and scale for these kinds of things. Um, there isn't that much time. And so working with that 97% is really critical in messaging and getting to scale. Yeah, that's great. I think we're all nodding along. That resonates really well. 
Um, okay, we have a question from Todd Lenart in the chat. Um, and I, so he, his question is, are there technologies that you think would help be more efficient with these efforts? And he works for a group that is interested in uh, learning how they can help. And somebody else, um, Stephanie mentioned CLT and mass timber. And I know that that's, we've been talking about this in the con a little bit as a cost to um, implement all of these solutions like thinning and prescribed burns, but there are also some economics in terms of like what you can do with the wood that's removed. And I know that's where CLT and mass timber come in uh, since there's so few marketable products that can use the small wood that you're removing typically. Um, but Zach or others, I'd, I'd love to hear your response to um, Todd's question about the other technologies and if CLT or mass timber plays a role. So it certainly does. And I may let our two foresters on the call talk a little bit more about the species and the opportunity for things like CLT or Orientis Trambord mm -hmm. veneer and even bioenergy and biochar uh, in certain cases. So I do think that's an important part. A lot of those technologies are actually pretty well understood and have been operating in Europe for in excess of 50 years. We're just a little bit behind the game here in the US and sort of bringing some of these technologies to market. The other piece of this I just want to highlight as I let Willie or perhaps Dr. Hesper talk more about what we can do with the wood and how creating wood products campuses could really create jobs in these rural economies is to think about a different application of technology, which is how might we better understand the ecosystem service values or, or the positive benefits conferred by a healthy forest. And there's a tremendous amount of technology that's being used in that context to understand the change in forest carbon stocks, to understand the change in fire risk and how some of that modeling takes place to understand the change in forest water use and how much more yield may be available for um, a system manager like Willie, in this case at the Yuba Water Agency. So when we talk about what allows the financing to happen, all that financial innovation is based on scientific innovation first. Until we can understand the benefits, measure and credibly qualify and quantify them, it's really hard to get those stakeholders to the table and, and put dollars on the table in a, in a real meaningful way. So I would call out not just the technology of what do we do with this small diameter wood that we're left with in the forest, but also how do we understand the benefits from a healthy forest from that perspective? Well, Shabon, you, you got me going. I mean, I've just wrote down about 10 things I could talk about. I don't think you want me to go on for 20 minutes, but um, there are a lot of technologies that just, you know, that they could be implemented right now, right? Like, like we mentioned, it's CLT or mass timber, biochar as a result of bioenergy, both of which are understood and there's, there's products out there and more to be had. You know, the simple thing like wood pellets. I mean, there's a global demand for wood pellets, you know, and it can be in uh, pellet mills can be in combination, constructed in combination with bioenergy facilities. Um, then there's these other project products that are like, they're, they're just in their inception, like cellulose uh, products, like similar to plastics, but using like the wood material in creating packaging and other, you know, more um, refined um, plastic type material. And I know that's just kind of theory right now, but there's, there are people working on that and I'm hoping to see, see more out of that. But the weakness is um, we need long-term commitments from the land managers. And so in our area, and I can only speak for the, the watershed that I work in, it's primarily, the land's primarily owned and managed by the U.S. Forest Service. And so right now, the way that their contracts work, it's, you know, two to three to five year, you know, timber sale contracts. You know, the, it, what I see is like a 30 year to 50 year old process that that's not thinking long term. It's not thinking like innovatively. And I'm, and, and Dr. Hesberg, I know you're a Forest Service guy, so I'm not, I'm not criticizing it. It's just, we need to think differently. We need to think if someone's going to bring in a $20 million mass timber, um, you know, mill, they, they need a long-term supplier, a long-term commitment. And they're not, I'm not saying that they need to be able to go out and clear cut the forest for 20 years, but they need a long-term supply of this small woody material so that they can, you know, put together a business plan and make a $20 million investment. And we're just starting with these relationships and thinking outside of the box. I mean, Zach and, and the Forest Resilience Bond, that's just one step in many steps we need to take to get these type of investments in, in the forest. But at least we've started it. And we're having the conversation. And if you would have said, hey, I'm going to be on a computer screen, you know, five years ago, if you would have said I'm going to be talking about this stuff today, um, I would say no way. But here we are. At least we're having the conversation. Yeah, that's great. We're making progress. We're absolutely even right. Even if it doesn't. Willie, really, when, when I was a junior forester, we had sustained yield units 
in the Western United States that were the very thing that you're describing. And when those contracts winked out and they were no longer uh, awarded, they simply disappeared. And most people who are practicing today don't even remember that we invented that 60 years ago, 65 years ago. And it's time to be able to have some facsimile of sustained use, especially for biomass. There's some need for technology innovation for um, how we visualize where we put uh, mill infrastructure. So is it permanent or is it temporary? How do we locate value added, uh, adding value to materials? Do we have a long haul for that or do we have a short haul? Is it possible for us to site temporary structures to be able to do that work? And, and hyper concentrate biomass for carbon sequestration or for fuel or mass timber. Each of these kinds of things are frontiers right now in research to, in some cases, it's reinventing something we already know about. Yeah, that's great. And I, um, there's a few more questions in the chat that I would love to get to, but actually we are at time. And I think unfortunately my, my primary objective as moderator is to keep us on time. So. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this session. I think it gives me some optimism, you know, when I am still daily checking our air quality reports here in San Francisco to see if it's safe to let my kids play outside. It, it gives me some optimism to know that um, we can look back five years and see how far we've come. And hopefully in another five years, we'll look back on this conversation and think that that was just the beginning. Uh, and I know that this group and, and Rockefeller and Blue Forest have been working together for years now on the Forest Resilience Bond. Um, from my perspective at Impact Assets, we started partnering with them earlier this year to bring the opportunity to our impact investing community. And earlier this month, we are excited that we just launched our Wildfire Resilience Fund. So if you're interested in supporting Blue Forest in their work and pursuing this, um, you can reach out to our engagement team or to myself, um, you can email engagement at impactassets.org. And any donations that come into that fund now are actually being matched um, by the Rockefeller Foundation. So we can double your impact and take this work even further. And if you wanna follow up with any of the panelists on the hop in platform, I think we can all message each other or find each other on LinkedIn and continue the conversation. Um, so thank you all for joining me and look forward to what's to come. Thank you, Siobhan. Thank you, Siobhan. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Man.